Tell me about the Peter Thiel Roth IRA story. In my very first pitch deck, I mentioned two individuals in that deck. One was Peter Thiel and the second was Sam Altman. Peter Thiel famously had invested $100,000 from his Roth IRA into Facebook in an early round and that $100,000 turned into a billion dollars. And so what I used to say was, we're allowed to choose how we're going to make a living, and yet somehow we're telling them they're not allowed to also invest savings in those businesses. You can bet your life, you bet your job and your weekly, monthly, annual income, but you can't bet your savings. How much should an ultra high net worth have in alternatives? Eric, I've been excited to get you on the podcast. Uh, we've, we've been friends since uh, I led your seed round back in January 2020. I just had an investor tell me, well, that was a very obvious uh, decision to lead that round. And I was very pleased to hear that. <laughs> so uh, welcome. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thanks for having me, David. Glad to be here. Before we start, uh, for those that don't know what, what Alto does, uh, what does Alto do? Alto enables individuals to easily access their retirement funds for purposes of investing in alternative assets. And alternative assets have taken on sort of a broad meaning for a lot of people. So for us, uh, one way to think about it is non-registered, non-publicly traded securities. It's private equity, venture capital, real estate, passion assets or real assets. And then, of course, crypto, which, you know, we can talk about whether or not crypto is an alternative asset anymore. You can trade it 24-7. It's uh, incredibly liquid. So all things alternative with your retirement money at Alto. So typically, retirements have been... IRAs, 401ks. If you have an employer, you you log into your 401k and you get like five different funds. So how is it that uh, you can invest your retirement funds in non-public vehicles? IRAs and 401ks are different vehicles. 401ks are sort of under the supervision of your employer. And whenever an employer has fiduciary responsibility in one way or another for the actions of their employees, they take the most conservative route possible and one that raises the least liability for them as the employer. When you are investing out of an IRA account, there's no, let's just say, employer oversight, right? It's all about what we refer to as self-direction and self-directed investing. And ever since ERISA was created in the early 1970s, it's allowed you to invest really in anything you want. When you get into a self-directed IRA construct, which is what Alto does, now it's really up to you. We're not going to play judge and jury. We're not a fiduciary. We're really an administrative partner. And we do all of the necessary reporting to the IRS on your behalf, but more importantly, we have created a transaction engine or transaction hub, which makes it easy for you to put your money to work in these alternative assets. And for GPs at a private equity fund or a venture capital fund or a real estate fund uh, or someone raising money for, for a company, we make it easy for them to accept that IRA capital. And, and we did that. Like, It's not really rocket science. It's just that this was this really paper-intensive, uh, time-intensive time-consuming, expensive proposition that we said, let's take some technology and apply it against this workflow and this process and take something that is otherwise complicated and involves these various parties and make it simple. I don't know, Eric, if I ever told you this, but I led your seed round Jan 2020 because I was a very loyal customer of Pensco IRA uh, before I joined, before I found about Alto and just Alto was just orders of magnitude better from a user experience. Tell me how you went about solving the problem. Well, we can start with your experience, by the way, because your experience and my experience were the same. I use Pensco myself. And, and Pensco is actually why I started Alto. Like, did you not? So we both and, have the same pain point. And, and the problem was I, I used Pensco and I, and I thought to myself, this can't. This really can't be this hard or this complicated or time-consuming or expensive. Let me use another custodian, and so I ended up using three custodians for three different investments, and it was all bad, and it was all different. Like when when you go place a trade to buy, you know, Alphabet, your experience at Fidelity and Schwab or whatever Robinhood, whatever platform you use, it's largely the same. <laughs> Right. Like I go, I click a button, I say I want 100 shares, I push buy or I push sell, whatever it is, and, I, and I'm done. But in making these alternative IRA investments, and each of them, by the way, was in a private company, my experience of trying to execute that transaction 
at each of these three different custodians was entirely different. Each required a different set of uh, due diligence material. Each required different things from me. Each required different things from the company that I was investing in. And each required me to do all the work for all the parties. And then I had to write a check at the end for the privilege of being able to make the investment, right? So I'm talking about the check that I wrote to the custodian for, for custodying the asset. And we, it was like seven, $800 investment or some, some absurd and, amount. And it would take like 10 weeks. Yeah, it was like getting a mortgage. Oh my God, it was crazy. But, it, and, and the thing was, I was comparing that 10 week to like, look, I tore my hair out. I was comparing that 10 week experience to what in a non IRA construct is a 10 minute experience, right? You get the docs, you sign them, you send the check, you're done. And so the question was from first principles, how close can we get to that? That required us to go to the rule books, if you will, to the regs and to ERISA and say, okay, what's required, what's not? And to basically build a workflow that would allow us to collect all the information that was required, ignore everything that wasn't. And then we did one other thing that was really important. We engaged what we refer to as the issuer, which is the company or fund that you're investing in. And we said, you know what, rather than requiring the investor to do all the work to figure out like the EIN and the bank account number and all this, uh, the address of the issuer, why don't we just let the issuer do 10 minutes of work and save the investor like an hour of back and forth trying to collect all those things that they probably never heard of or didn't know existed. And so by including the issuer in the process, we really smoothed things out and we allowed subscription documents to flow back and forth in an appropriate manner for electronic signature, which didn't exist in this industry prior to us and now does, right? I mean, that's like a table stakes. You could you could DocuSign anything, but for some reason you couldn't do DocuSign in the standard IRA world. And so we fixed that as part of the workflow that, that we built. We just said, you know what? We're gonna ask people for what's required and we're not gonna ask them for the stuff that isn't. Not rocket science, just trying to take that which is complicated and make it really straightforward and simple. And the very first time I heard of Alto was when I was making an AngelList investment and I was scrolling down and it, it had a little check mark that said, would you like to do this through your IRA? And being a Pensco customer, I thought it was very fascinating. I basically investigated further and I reached out. Tell me about your platform integrations and how you've used that to build the business. That's a great question. I think you've probably heard me say this before. Uh, it's better to be lucky than good. I mean, it's best to be both lucky and good, but our integration with AngelList is one of the, and I, I do believe by the way, that in order to be successful with a startup, you, you kind of got to get lucky here and there. You never know exactly where it's going to be. Uh, and your timing has to be right. And you know, it's kind of hard to know whether or not your, your timing is correct. And with AngelList, it was one of those sort of business development calls where we had this theory that we wanted to integrate with the other investment platforms that were popping up at the time. Remember, this was the beginning of sort of the Reg CF craze, right? And uh, regulation crowdfunding, Title III, the Jobs Act, and Republic, and WeFunder, and, and others. And uh, Angelus was certainly the leader in the clubhouse in terms of what was happening for angel investment activity. And then it would, of course, um, grow and evolve into what it is today, which has been spectacular to watch and see. Lo and behold, um, in our very first business development call with Angelus, Mike Dougherty. I think he has his own startup now. I, yeah, I need to and, reach and, out to him. It's been a while. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of a well-known Silicon Valley Angelus character. Love Mike. Um, for obvious reasons. In our first business development call, where I was explaining to him why IRA capital would be important for this type of private alternative investment, he sort of I watched the demo and then he said, yeah, I get it. This is different. Let's integrate. Like, And that was it. And and so once we were integrated with Angelus, then, every, then that was like the stamp of approval, right? I think integrations are one of the most underrated business topics. It essentially drives down CAC, not close to zero, but almost close to zero. And some of these financial products, you have CACs that are in the thousands or tens of thousands for enterprise. It's pretty wild. So you got AngelList as this, you know, blue chip client for, for FinTech, and then you just used it as a reference to, to get all the other platforms. Unpack that a little bit for me. I, I agree with your comment, by the way, about the importance of integrations and, and what it can do for CAC. The, the flip side, of course, is that you can also die waiting, you know, so early stage companies can die waiting for this integration with this big distribution partner. And that's why I say there's luck involved, luck and, and timing and 
having Mike Dougherty on the opposite side of that that early Zoom, you know, that was that was lucky for us. He just got it. The light bulb went off, and so he did the integration. The the thing about integrations is that it, not only does your team have to have the technical chops and know how to deliver, but you need the engineering team at the partner to have the right chops, know-how, and prior, prioritization from product and, and senior leaders to, to put you in their roadmap. I don't know if you remember this, but the original thesis was, you know, 70 plus percent of investable assets in the United States live in these retirement accounts. Put a number on that. We're talking about tri trillions of dollars, right? Yeah, that's right. It's like, so IRAs alone are like, 13 trillion, 401ks are maybe eight to nine trillion, which is counterintuitive. Most people think there's more money in 401ks, but there isn't. There's more money in, in IRAs. How, how much of that is Peter Thiel? The god the godfather of IRAs, yeah. <laughs> but now probably a trillion, but uh, at least a billion, we all know, just ask Congress. So, so you're talking about the original thesis uh, that a lot of the money was, I, I thought that was still the thesis. So how has that thesis evolved? Well, well no, that, that's the, the, actually the thesis hasn't changed. I think the way we execute ha, has evolved. So, But the thesis is that in order for um, alternative assets to make it into the mainstream, you have to look at where the mainstream has their cash and they have cash in retirement accounts. So the whole idea was to make it easy for individuals to, to sort of how we open the, the, the show, right? Make it easy for individuals to access their retirement accounts and invest in alternative assets. That was the thesis, that's still the same, and I think we're still right. And, and what's different is execution. So originally, you had to have your own investment opportunity, sort of the way you had investment opportunities when you went to Pensco, and then eventually to Alto. And then it was, you know what, you could go to one of our investment platform partners, AngelList, for example, Republic, for example, uh, Masterworks, for example, and you could find an investment opportunity there and then invest with your IRA via those platforms. Now we have just at the end of last year launched the Alto Marketplace. So now you can come to Alto. You don't have to know what it is you're going to invest in. You can come to the Alto Marketplace and you can find your own investment opportunity there. And so we have really started uh, in the fund space with both some private equity, real estate, um, venture capital fund opportunities. Uh, I think we've already done a wine funds. We've got a whiskey funds coming. Um, we have two really large asset manager names coming with, with private credit funds, but I can't disclose who they are. So, so that's exciting. And, and the, the execution continues to evolve. The team continues to get better. When, when we first started, it was a little bit like shouting at windmills in terms of the importance of alternative assets and, you know, 40, 30, 30 instead of 60, 40. And now it just sort of seems like every wealth management report that gets written says, you need to have an understanding of alternative assets. You know how you need to know how you're going to uh, invest in the space. You need a good advisor to help you do that. And, you know, we're fortunate in, in that we're sort of positioned right in the middle of it. You have a strong personal belief in the importance of alternatives being open to IRAs. Why is that? I have a very strong belief that alternatives ought to be open to all people. And as we were discussing earlier, most people have money in their retirement accounts. So that's why IRAs. But to go back to the point that alternative assets really ought to be available to most people, I think we have historically had a very paternalistic approach and oversight to what people can and can't invest in. And I think it's somewhat hypocritical. I mean, if, if you just think about the percentage of the population that small businesses employ in the U.S., it's like we're allowed to go, we're allowed to, to choose how we're going to make a living. Like I can go work for Alto, you can go work for 10X. At some point, there were people who were choosing to work for Facebook before Facebook was Facebook and Google before Google was Google. And yet somehow we're telling them they're not allowed to also uh, invest savings in those businesses. You can bet your life, <laughs> you bet your job and your, and, and your weekly, monthly, annual income, but you can't bet your savings. And, you know, bet's probably not the right word. You, you're making an investment. And I, you, there's a saying that wealth does not beget uh, intelligence, but intelligence can beget wealth. But I think we, we too often forget that intelligence can beget wealth. And if people can show themselves, uh, you know, worthy of doing their homework and diligence and choosing to invest in what it is they want to invest in, I think they ought to be allowed to do that. We've seen in the institutional world, in the institutional LP world, institutions that have not leaned into venture the last 20 years have really started to lag behind. There's been this 
I guess, gap between uh, richer and poorer institutions. And the same seems like it should apply in the individual world. I, no argument for me. I totally agree with you. I, I think what, what's really interesting, if, if we were to pull the regulation crowdfunding apart, which I don't want pulled apart at all, but if we were to get really critical, I think it would be really fair for someone to ask the question, is investing in early stage companies on crowdfunding platforms the place that you should start with the American public in terms of where they're putting money to work? Or should we have said, this is where funds should make themselves available to the American public? We should let the American public invest with those asset managers who have proven themselves over time, right? So they, they have some sort of track record. Or you put up other guardrails, which says, you know what? If a fund manager is able to raise 80% institutional capital, they can take 20% retail capital, no matter what the retail investor looks like. A signal of short, sorts, a signal right. of, of a legitimate so fund. Signal rather than noise. And... Um, you know, so so I would argue if we were going to start someplace, we should have started with enabling the retail investor to participate with fund managers. But instead, we said, "Hey, you get to invest in the next Facebook," which I also like. But you know, there's something in in VC investing and early stage investing, which I know you know that the power law, which says really you need a portfolio of, you know, call it 100 companies because you really don't know which one, two, or three are your big winners. To your point on power laws, after you get about 30, somewhere between 30 to 50 companies, depending on how much you model a breakout, you're, you're uh, more likely than not to have a breakout in your portfolio, which historically had led to 3x plus returns. But I think if you look at how institutional investors build their portfolio, they first start by doing funds. And then, you know, five, 10 years later, they start to build out their direct business, which most high net worth and most individuals have an intuition to do a single investment, try to beat the manager that's been doing it for 20, 30 years, and then go to the managers because they don't want to pay fees. I think you and I are saying the same thing is where you really should start is by understanding what the people who do it for a living are doing and how they do it. Going back to Jason Calacanis' book uh, back uh, about five, six years ago, and he, he brought up a really interesting point, which let's say you have a million dollars to invest. You should put 1% of that or 5% of it, let's call it $50,000 for the first couple of years. Make small debts, make all your mistakes on small dollars, and then take the nine hundred fifty thousand dollars and invest it much more intelligently. I don't know if he did that or not, but his portfolio approach, whatever it is, seemed to have worked. From from one uh, VC to another, tell me about the Peter Thiel uh, Roth IRA story. In my very first pitch deck, uh, I mentioned two individuals in that deck. One was Peter Thiel, and the second was Sam Altman. And this is back in two thousand fifteen or sixteen, I think. And Sam had had tweeted at some point that he thought it was crazy that you could only invest your 401k in stocks and bonds. You could invest in private companies. And I was like, hey, over here, well, you know, well, we'll, we'll help you fix that. Um, and then Peter Thiel famously had invested $100,000 from his Roth IRA into uh, into Facebook in an early round, and that $100,000 turned into a billion dollars. And so what I used to say was to participate on Alto IRA, and certainly in crowdfunding, you don't have to have $100,000. You can have 100,000 or 1,000 or 10,000, and you can still get the same ROI that he got. You, you're not gonna get the billion, but you still get a big return. And Congress tried to, I think it was the Peter Thiel bill, or that was the name of the bill, they tried to basically- It was a nickname. Pay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, tell, tell me about that. And, and obviously that, that failed. And uh, tell, me, tell me about the, that congressional bill. Look, I, I, I think that's just sour grapes on the part of uh, some, some folks in, in Congress. It's like we made the rules. He played by them. I'm going to assume he played by them. Them's are the breaks, right? Like the, the, the government said, hey, I want, my, I want to collect my tax today. And so if you pay me on those retirement dollars today and then put them put them to work and you promise not to take them out until you reach retirement age, then it's tax free when, when you get there because you pay you gave me money today. This is the government saying to the investor, give me money today. Well, <laughs> he made a hundred thousand dollar investment having already paid his taxes. He's going to get to the end. He's going to have more than a billion dollars in there. And Congress decided they didn't like that. Or at least I should say some in Congress decided they didn't like that. It, like. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, 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 I think um, if, you, if you live by the rules, you die by the rules. The congressman told me 
on a similar note, they will never get rid of the Roth IRA because the Roth IRA is a free loan to the government. So whoever's in, in Congress will never vote to give themselves less money in the short term for, for long term gains. It's a it's a conflict of interest. Yeah, look, it says, hey, give me your tax today. Give me your tax today. It's like, okay, I'll give you the tax today. And that way, you know, as I invest, I don't have to pay you tax tomorrow. And that that's that's the trade we made. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Most businesses use up to 16 tools to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But there's one platform that's replaced them all. That's Deal. D-E-E-L. Deal is the all-in-one HR and payroll platform built for global work. The smartest startups in my portfolio use Deal to integrate HR, payroll, compliance, and everything else in a single product. Focus on what you do best. Scale your business and let Deal do the rest. Deal allows you to hire, onboard, and pay talent in over 150 countries, from background checks to built-in contracts. You can manage the entire worker lifecycle from a single and easy-to-use interface. Click the link in the show notes below to book a free, no-strings-attached demo with Deal today. Let's say somebody's, you know, a, a credit investor with three million dollars, or maybe a qualified purchaser with five million dollars. How much should a, a ultra high net worth have in alternatives? I think that's a very personal question. And I, and, and I think it really depends on someone's risk profile and also how much effort and work they're willing to do to assess the investment opportunities in front of them. I was having a conversation with another um, founder yesterday um, a, about a particular investment. And he just said, like, I don't know how, P how, how founders find the time to do due diligence on other investment opportunities. I just don't have that kind of time, so I do nothing. And I totally understand where, where that person's coming from in, the, in this particular context. There are other people who, you know, they'll hire RIAs or other financial advisors to help them, and they talk about portfolio construction. I think where we are today is that for most people, and I'm talking about high net worth individuals, whether it's your $3 million credit investor or your $5 million qualified purchaser, it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 40% of your portfolio. But what you're trying to do with true portfolio diversification is reduce the volatility while simultaneously increasing your returns. And so there's a lot being written right now about 40, 30, 30. That kind of feels right for people who um, are in that QP qualified purchaser zone. If you're someone who needs more frequent liquidity, it's probably five to 10% of your portfolio. And, and you wanna figure out exactly what that five to 10% is getting invested in, right? Because what you don't wanna do is exactly what Jason was saying. You don't wanna take it all and invest in one company. That's a bad strategy, right? But you can invest 20% of that five to 10% in three different funds. You could uh, invest in, or, uh, in a piece of property. You could, you know, whether it's commercial or residential, you can invest in crypto. People just get into analysis paralysis and people have been thinking for now 10 years, 11 years, should I, put, should I put all my money in crypto? Should I put no money in crypto? And they've seen this kind of incredible wave. I, I interviewed the CEO of Bitwise and he actually has some, some data on sharp ratios that shows that anywhere from one to 5% is the correct amount of money to have in crypto for, for institutional investors. There's this whole trend trying to get people just to put in 1% into crypto, I think is really important getting them out of that analysis paralysis because certainly alternatives have a space in people's asset class. It's just a matter of getting started, making mistakes with small dollars and learning and adapting to the asset class. The average person should have one to two to 3% exposure to crypto. I, I'll even go so far as to be a little bit more specific. Bitcoin and ETH at the very least. I, I think both of those assets are here to stay. When I first learned about Bitcoin, for me, it was probably 2014, you know, so about, about 10 years ago. It just kind of made sense to me. Be, and, and part of that was I've never understood gold once we went off the gold standard. Like, what? why is it worth what it's worth? Like, it, what are you going to do with it, you know, if the, if the apocalypse, uh, you know, hits? I never, I never understood gold ETFs. You, well, because the, well, one, the one time you want the gold, is, you can't use it. So I, I just thought that was always interesting. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why gold ETFs exist is because most people can't actually take the gold, right? So I get why they're a product. I don't understand why you would buy them. Yeah, no, me, me neither. And and so when I started learning about Bitcoin, I was like, oh wow, 
like this and not too uh, not too late thereafter, they started talking about Bitcoin as a as a gold replacement. Um, and there are lots of quantitative analyses that that are made that, OK, if there are X number of Bitcoin available in the world uh, and gold is worth X and if it gets replaced, whatever, like that Bitcoin, a single Bitcoin is going to be worth whatever it's going to be worth. And um, the, like I kind of get that. And so, look, all of my Bitcoin I, and Ethereum, for that matter, I hold in my crypto IRA at Alto. Eat your own medicine. I do. You know, the dogs eat the dog food, right? And um, I, I'm a macro level person. I think big picture is going to be here for a while and it's going to be worth a lot more than it is today. Humans are terrible traders from a psychological perspective. They're like that's that's proven. Very few of us can be Warren Buffett, right? It's funny you say that. I listened to an interview of Stan Drunken Miller, who's considered one yep. of the greatest traders of all time, and he said nothing was nothing felt as cheap as after it had gone up sixty percent. You have these <laughs> positive emotions. And I reflected and I said, if this guy who's in his seventies, one of the greatest traders of all time, has been doing it fifty years, he struggles with this issue of liquidity. I probably should be humble enough to not think that I could out Stan Drunken Miller. It's Stan Drunken Miller. So. I, I love illiquid ass, asset classes when I don't need the liquidity. Uh, nearly every person I know that's made money in crypto, serious money, uh, it's, it's been through funds that were illiquid. I know, some, I know there's these theoretical people that have owned Bitcoin since 2011. Maybe I've met a couple, but I think they're much more of a myth than a real thing. And I think the people that have made a lot of money have been locked up or, you know, or in illiquid instruments. My thesis is, is that investing in alternative assets and, and, both funds and direct companies is the best thing for people to do because you have a thesis at the outset and you can't wake up one day and decide I'm getting out, you know, just because the winds are blowing in a different direction. You're, you're going to live with that investment. And, and I think that's good for the exact reason that we're talking about, you know, which is that you're supposed to buy low and sell high. And most people do just the opposite because we're emotional and our psyches work in, in funny ways. True alternative asset investments force you to lock in and live with your thesis. We're gonna be wrong from time to time, but at least we're not, not gonna be wrong in the interim because we pushed the sold button or push the buy button just because you know we saw some, some price movement. A, a lot is said about you know your stock goes down 80% and then you sell it. I, I always struggled with you know if my public book, it goes up 40%, I'm like, yes, let's lock in that game. Um, that's what I struggle with. And that's why I'm, I'm thankful for the illiquidity in venture because you have companies like uh, Alto that in my book are, are up over 10x. If I was getting offers every day, depending on my mood, maybe I, maybe I would have sold early. And this kind of forces that and forces you to, to kind of be long uh, towards assets that have this asymmetry, right? And when it works, it works exceptionally well. When it doesn't work, typically, you know, there's some, some exit and some, some downside protection. I don't mean to pick on Robinhood and, and sort of, we know, we all know the meme stock stuff and all the trading and options. And, you know, I don't, I really don't think that's good for, for the average investor, but they were so, Robinhood was so good at what they did and the product that they built that people were just checking all the time, right? Like, oh, buy, sell, buy, sell, but like mm. not a healthy investment uh, uh, <laughs> not a healthy investment approach, in my opinion. We'll get right back to the interview. But first, to stay updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including the very latest data on venture returns and insights on how to raise capital from limited partners, subscribe to our free newsletter at 10xcapitalpodcast.com. That's www.10xcapitalpodcast.com. There is academic research that shows that the more people check their public portfolio, the worse their returns. There, it is. It has actually been studied, which is intuitive. I believe it. In terms of Alto, how does somebody actually use their IRA and Alto to invest into companies? Yeah, so you can still um, do what we call BYOD, which is bring your own deal. Um, so, so that which was the core Alto product number one, where you come to Alto, you create your IRA account, you'll either transfer from another IRA or you'll roll over from a 401k. Uh, and then have funds available to invest either in uh, crypto on the one hand or traditional alternative assets on the other. And um, if you're investing in your own deal, you're able to invite an issuer to the platform and they upload the necessary subscription docs and, and other documentation that's required to complete an investment and transaction. Or you can go over to the altoira.com slash marketplace. If you're a qualified investor, which for the most part right now is accredited, 
and you, you can invest in uh, a farmland fund. You can invest in a wine fund. We've got a whiskey fund coming. Um, Kearney Jackson, you know, our friends, Shriram and Sunil. Co investors in the seed round. We did. That, there you go. Uh, love those guys. There are others that I'm forgetting, but, but you can go look. What's the future look like for Alta? What are you guys working on? So you and I both know that I'm working on something that I think is super cool. And uh, just as soon as you can tell your enormous audience, I will tell you to tell your enormous audience, but I, we, we can't do it just yet. Enormous by AUM. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Uh, that's great. Um, any, anything else? Like, can this, because you're essentially a marketplace, you're a platform, can this be a $10 billion standalone kind of behemoth? Or is it something that's going to be a strategic asset for one of the, one of the large financial players? You know, I, I think the answer to both questions is yes. But, you know, my crystal ball, <laughs> it, it, like it doesn't work every single day. What I, what I can tell you, and I think you know this about me already, is I don't wake up trying to build a company made for sale. I just try to build a great company. And where that takes us is the fun part. You know, that's that's the journey and, and that's the unknown. And that's why I like getting up in the morning. If at some point someone says, hey, this would be a great tuck in for us. We're like, all right, well, tell me about that. What does that mean? How, how's that going to work? And, and we'll assess it. I mean, we have shareholders. We have investors. You're one. Um, I very much want to create a huge return for those who put their faith in me and us, the company. VCs always say, when are you going to sell? And the, there's only one right answer, which is never, we're going to take it for 20 years. But from, from, a, from a pragmatic standpoint, if somebody's coming to you and saying, don't worry about the next 20 years, we're going we're gonna to assume that you're going to grow over the next 20 years and give you the money today. You have to take a serious look. You also have to be rational and be a good steward also of LP capital. Well, and you have a, yeah, you have a fiduciary responsibility, right? And I don't draw hard lines. I don't like live by a certain set of fixed rules. Um, so long as I maintain the energy and thrill that I have for this business that we're building with the 60 other Altonians that are building it, then I'll, then I'll keep doing it. Thank you for jumping on the podcast. What would you like our listenership to know about you, about Alto, about anything else you'd like to share? I don't believe that any one sort of founder entrepreneur is the key to a company's success. Like it, it's the per Startups are the perfect example of it takes a village and it, it really takes everybody. And you really have to be aware of when it is you're getting lucky and how to take advantage of that luck that's sitting in front of you. The luck and timing is, is so important and um, often understated. And, you know, and also just working with great people. It's really about the people. <laughs> uh, bonus question. You said timing a couple of times. What exactly was the catalyst for Alto's growth? Wow. Um, we were in the right place at the right time as the rest of the world was beginning to understand that alternative assets needed to play a bigger role. It was in really the, the, rise of, the rise of Alt and you were the piping to access this, the retirement. That's uh, right. You know, and, and we had a thesis around that, but you never know, you never know if your thesis is going to line up with the, the rest of the world. This time it did. As you mentioned, better to be lucky than good and good to be both. Uh, well, th thanks again, Eric, and uh, hope, hope to see you soon. Thanks, David. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. 